everyone and welcome to making it on Mondays. I am just going to check my setup as usual and make sure that I am I'm live. Yes, I'm live. Awesome. Because Facebook doesn't always love me on a Monday, but it seems to love me today, so that's good. So, my name is Louise Jeffrey. I am an acupuncturist, I am a practitioner of Chinese medicine, and I am a mindset coach. And I am here to support you no matter where you are in your fertility journey. In fact, our whole team is here to support you no matter where you are on your fertility journey. So I am going to talk today about four things that you should know if you're trying to conceive naturally. Four things that you should know about your cycle if you're trying to conceive naturally. All right, so let's get started. All right, so we're going to be on uh, today for about 10 minutes. I'm going to be talking for about 10 minutes. Now, if you're on live, let me know. If, or if you're on the recording, let me know. I'd love to know that you're here. It's always nice to know, um, you know, when somebody's on, on with you. And if you've got any questions or if there's anything that resonates with you today, please, um, you know, please let us know. If there's anything that you would like, um, you know, to know more about, please let us know. As I say, we're here to support you. All right. And if you're in Sydney or in Brisbane or anywhere on the east coast of Australia, I hope you're staying dry because it certainly is wet. Um, you can probably hear the rain outside my window. You might be able to hear it. We're just really getting a massive amount of rain at the moment. All right. So why is it important uh, to know about your cycle if you're trying to conceive naturally? Well, because there are certain things that are really going to be helpful for you, for you to be able to tell when you're ovulating, right? And if you can identify your fertile window, you're going to be much more likely to fall pregnant naturally. Now, I don't know about you, but I certainly didn't get taught about my cycle at school. I remember very basically in biology, we did um a woman's menstrual cycle um and how women bleed every month and very basically we learned about the sperm and the egg but other than that i certainly didn't get taught in a lot of detail um you know in in our sex ed classes i don't even really remember if we had them but i know some people did um or in biology or if we did go into a lot of detail about um, you know, about a woman's cycle, uh, you know, then I certainly didn't know about it. And I've spoken to many women over the years who said, you know, there's just so many things I didn't know. So I wish that I did know these things because for so many years I was trying not to fall pregnant, right? Um, before I started trying to have a family. And if I'd only known, for example, that I couldn't fall pregnant straight after my period or right before my period, it would have actually meant that I would have experienced far less worry and anxiety and I would have been far more in tune with my body, right? So you may already know what I'm going to tell you about today. So if you do, excuse me if I'm telling you what you already know, but um, what we find in the clinic is that there's a lot of women there that don't actually know about um, the different signs, etc., cetera, of, of their cycle um, and some of the more uh, you know some of the finer details which can really really be helpful all right so let's start number one in four things to know about your cycle if you're trying to conceive naturally number one is if you watch the mucus changes around ovulation you should notice that a change will happen in your most fertile days now what happens when we're nearing ovulation is that the mucus changes from for some women, it's kind of a pasty or a crumbly mucus, or for some of us, maybe non-existent. It changes to an egg white consistency, right? Now it might be opaque, or it might be clear, completely clear. And we call this egg white mucus spin bucket. And the reason it's called that is because the strands that run in this fertile mucus, they run long ways, right? And the reason that the strands run long ways and why it's, it's kind of stretchy in that way, like an egg white, is so that the sperm can actually swim up that mucus and get up to where they need to go, right? So for you to be able to tell whether or not you've got egg white mucus, really need to pay attention. So you can look on your panties or on your liner if you wear a liner, or when you wipe, you can actually check and see if it's 
you know, what the different kinds of mucus are, but you're specifically looking for, um, you know, an egg white type mucus. Now, if there's enough, you can actually, um, you know, you can actually feel that it's an egg white mucus, but if there isn't, then, um, you know, then as I say, you'll just be able to see it, you know, on your panties or on your liner or when you wipe. Now, not every woman will have significant mucus changes, and that doesn't mean that you won't fall pregnant or that you can't conceive. Um, but for a lot of women, you'll actually notice if you pay close attention that the egg, that the mu mucus will change to, um, to egg white. Okay. Now we know that, um, that the mucus in an ideal world starts to pick up in the few days before your ovulation. And then your peak day is generally when you have the most mucus because that mucus is produced in response to the, um, the rising estrogen and the glands in the cervix respond to the rising estrogen. And so as we start to progress through our cycle, as estrogen starts to rise, we start to get more mucus. And then, as I say, in, a, in an ideal world, we get the most mucus on that peak day, but it's not always the case for every single woman. Um, but if you start tracking it, you will start to notice. Okay, so that's number one in our four things to know. Number two is BBT tracking. Now, BBT tracking, is a really useful tool in assessing your ovulation and in tracking your cycle. Now, if you don't know what BBT tracking is, it's basal body temperature tracking. And we can use this tool to be able to tell whether or not we're ovulating, right? And how, whether we're having an adequate follicular phase and an adequate luteal phase. Now, follicular phase is that one before your ovulation, the two weeks, it can be longer or shorter depending. And then typically the two weeks, if you're on a regular cycle after your ovulation, is called the luteal phase. Now, if in a in a um, you know if you're one of those women who has a, a a really clear clinical picture on your basal body temperature chart, you will have a 0.2 to 0.3 rise at ovulation in your basal body temperature. Okay. Now, how we take our basal body temperature is that we use either a vaginal or a mouth thermometer. Um, now, a vaginal uh, thermometer is actually typically more accurate. So if you go into your pharmacy and you ask them for an ovulation um, thermometer and ask for the vaginal one, it's often, it's often more, more accurate, right? Um, so you take that vaginal, that mouth thermometer, and you're actually going to take your basal body temperature before you get out of bed every single day at the same time. Now, that can be a little bit tricky if you get out of bed at different times, but what you typically need to do is thinking of your week ahead, the really you want to be taking it at the same time every day, so that would be at the earliest time before you get up. So if your earliest day of getting up is 5.30 in the morning, then you're going to be setting your alarm for 5.30 every day and making sure that you take it at the same time because we have to get a baseline at the same time every day. All right? Now, it needs to be at the same time before we get up because if we get up, what tends to happen is that uh, our, our basal body temperature goes up and gives us an incorrect reading, right? So we have to take it before we actually even get out of bed. And we must not have gotten up for four hours prior to that reading, to that taking of temperature. So if you've gotten up to go to the, to the bathroom two hours before, you need to make a little note to show that that might be an anomaly, all right? But ideally, you don't get up for four hours prior to taking your temperature. Now, as I said, what we're looking for is a 0.2 to 0.3 rise, degree rise, between our follicular phase and our luteal phase. Okay. Now, you're not going to see exactly the same basal body temperature every single day. You'll probably see this happening. And then what you'll notice is, so you generally want to take an average of that, is that there might be a little small dip before ovulation, and then it goes up, right? Now, uh, it goes up. And then you see that it'll, you know, jump a little bit up and down across. But we're looking for an average, that the average in your, in your luteal phase is 0.2 to 0.3 degrees higher than in your follicular phase in the first part of your cycle. All right. Now, again, this is not absolute. Some women find this really, really hard. Um, and it can be stressful if your readings aren't showing a clear pattern. So if you've done this for a couple of months and you're finding that it really doesn't work um, for you and it's all over the place, Talk to your Chinese medicine practitioner because we find the basal body temperature when a woman is trying to conceive naturally, it's really, really helpful for us to see when you're ovulating, but also because it, it, it helps us to do an ovulation treatment or, or a 
to know exactly when we should shift our protocol from follicular phase to luteal phase. But it also is helpful for us to see if there are any insufficiencies in your luteal phase, for example, right? Because sometimes, as an example, if you have a low basal body temperature, it might be, one of the things might be that you may not have enough circulating progesterone in your luteal phase, right? And I'm just pulling something out of the hat. But it can be really, really helpful for us to see if there's anything. You know, whether the clinical picture is looking okay, or is it kind of, you know, all over the place and there's no clear picture. All right. If it stresses you out, don't do it. There are other ways. Okay. All right. So that's number two, basal body temperature tracking. Number three, if it's harder for you to tell when you're ovulating, right, either because your cycle is irregular or you're not getting a clear picture on the BBT, then using ovulation predictor kits every one to two days from around cycle day 10 can be very, very helpful. Okay. Now, OPKs or ovulation predictor kits look for LH or luteinizing hormone. And some of them also look for or detect E2, which is estrogen, right? And what you do is you wee on a stick and it will let you know, um, you know, whether or not you're, you're coming up to ovulation or whether you're about to ovulate or just have, okay? Now, all the tests work differently and we generally have, um, you know, different kinds of tests. Um, and for some women, you may find that, that a different brand of test works for you, but another one doesn't. Um, but it's, it's worthwhile trying for a couple of months, one particular brand and seeing what happens. Now, if you have uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, so PCOS, it can be really hard using these tests because sometimes with women with PCOS, we can have extended LH surges, right? But in general, most ovulation tests are accurate for most people. Um, what we do know that is that in about one in 10 women, one in 10 women actually struggle to get a positive result on the OPKs. Um, and that can be typically if you have a typically high or a low luteinizing hormone, or if you don't have a very typical LH surge, or sometimes you might have two, right? So not all ovulation tests are going to catch your ovulation. Now, if this is the case and you're finding that it's really, really hard for you, then you can ask your pharmacist for a semi-quantitative quantitative test rather than a thresh, threshold-based test, because that actually gives you a number, right? So just ask your pharmacist um, and, um, and try to change brands and actually see what happens. But it'll all depend on your hormones, right? Because us humans are not an exact science, unfortunately. Not everything works perfectly in, in an absolute clinical picture, all right? But if you've been trying to conceive for six months or so with no results, um, you know, you've done your BBT testing, you've done... Um, and you've uh, and you've done ovulation predictor kits and they don't work, or you're not getting any reading, or even as it's showing that you're ovulating but you're not, um, but you're not falling pregnant, then it's definitely worthwhile getting your reproductive hormones checked with your GP, right? So we're ideally, ideally going to get them checked on cycle day two, right, to check the follicular phase hormones, and then again on around cycle day 18, or so, which is kind of or, or whatever four days post ovulation is for you. Right, and that's ready to check that you've indeed ovulated and to check for your progesterone levels. All right, so that's us talking about ovulation predictor kits. Then our fourth thing in four things to know about your cycle if you're trying to conceive naturally is if you experience severe pain or unusually heavy, heavy bleeding or clotting during your period, then it may be worthwhile seeing a fertility specialist to run some tests. Okay. Now, the fertility specialist may choose to run some scans and they may choose to do a laparoscopy to investigate if there's anything else going on, like endometriosis, for example. Now, a disclaimer that I just want to add here is that not everyone with heavy and painful periods has endometriosis and not everyone with endometriosis has pain and heavy periods. But for us in Chinese medicine, the reason that I'm bringing this up today is that heavy periods with dark blood, with clotting, and with severe pain, really means for us that the blood is not flowing as smoothly in the uterus as it should. All right, so we believe that there is an obstruction in the blood, and we call this blood stagnation. And so we will use certain acupuncture points protocols, all right, um, particularly in, this, in the um, well, different things in, in, in the first part and the second part of your cycle and we may well use blood moving chinese herbs right to help reduce the pain and smooth the flow of blood because for us it's really really important that the flow of blood is 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 smooth and adequate 
All right. And what we would like to see happen over time is an improvement in blood flow. So in other words, more fresh red blood and less clotting. And we want to see a more medium flow and less pain. Right. And if this is what happens, then all these signs are, are good signs that the blood flow in the uterus is flowing better, that it's less obstructed. And for us, it means it's more conducive to an embryo being able to implant. All right. Does it make sense? So that's really what we just need to keep an eye on in terms of your um, your bleed, right? You know, in your menstrual cycle. Okay, now just a little PS here. I really want to caveat this with saying every one of us is different. And not all women fit the clinical picture that I have described in terms of the BBT, the OPKs, um, you know, and uh, you know, and the and the bleeding, all right, for example. So so some women may have heavy bleeding, lots of pain, clotting, and they still manage to fall pregnant fine, okay? But these are definitely things that we just want to keep an eye on. So it doesn't mean that you can't fall pregnant. It's just really, really helpful in assessing your cycle and knowing how you can know when you're ovulating and how you can actually improve your cycle if you need to find out what's going on because you're not falling pregnant naturally. All right. So just to recap today, because I know that I said 10 minutes and I'm already at 16. Number one, if you watch the mucus changes around ovulation, you should notice a change that'll indicate your most fertile days. Number two, you can use BBT tracking. It's a very useful tool in assessing ovulation and tracking our cycle. And we can give you, you can either download an app or we can give you a printed out sheet where you can plot it on a graph if you like to see it visually and you like to, to write it down. I used to do that and I, and I found it so incredibly useful. Um, number three, if it's harder for you to tell when you're ovulating, you can use OPKs um, and use them generally every one to two days from around cycle day 10. And then the fourth thing in four things to know about your cycle, if you're trying to conceive naturally, if you experience severe pain or unusually heavy bleeding, heavy bleeding during your period, then it might be worthwhile seeing a fertility specialist to run some tests. And obviously your acupuncturist or your Chinese medicine practitioner, if you're seeing one, will ask you a whole lot of questions around this and then treat you accordingly. So if you've got any questions, let us know or any suggestions in terms of what you want to hear more of, um, you know, please let us know. Or if there's anything around what I've said today that you'd like me to expand more on, um, you know, please let us know. I'd love to hear from you guys. I uh, hope you have a beautiful week and I will see you next Monday. Bye for now.